There we go. Hello my dance friends and welcome to my channel. Today I get to chat with the one and only Amy Sigil. Amy is a world fusion dancer based out of California. Amy is the director of the dance troupe Unmata and Hot Pot Studios and the creator of ITS or Improv Team Sync. Today we're going to chat about her transition from Hot Pot Studios, which had to unfortunately close its doors earlier this year, to her new dance space. Hot Pot Studios has been a very inviting and sacred space for dancers from all over the world. But this year, Amy has been able to create a new outdoor temple space. We're also going to talk about her transition to online classes, online communication with students, including her updated websites. And she's going to tell us a little bit about the evolution of IT. Yes, the name and the style. So without further ado, here's Amy. Hello, Amy. Hi, Blair. I am super excited to get to chat with you about all the things. Seems like you've been evolving every single facet of your dance life. And I know that the year 2020 has brought so many changes for so many people, but just within the small realm of dance, there's been a huge transition, especially with the Farewell to Hot Pot Studios, which was around for almost two decades, correct? Yeah. And students from all around the world came to you there. And I can only imagine what you especially and your dance family have gone through to say goodbye to that sacred space. And my heart goes out to you for that. But I've also seen your absolutely beautiful, serene, new dance temple that you've created at your home. And I just wanted to hear how that transition has been for you. Well, I'm actually glad we're having this conversation months later. <laughs> than when I actually closed it because um, I definitely have a different perspective now and I'm um, more grateful to share this perspective than the four perspectives. So right now my uh, creation baby grew up and grew out and I really see it as an expansion of the family, an expansion of the brand, expansion of the work, but the actual space of creation was the hardest thing to let go. And I think what it taught me is that this small, always too small box that we had was the most artistic creation I've done in my entire life. And I found myself attached to four walls, a floor and a ceiling. And that's never happened for me before. I haven't really been attached to many houses, apartments, um, other places I've taught, but it was specific for this. And everybody kept telling me, you know, it's just four walls, Amy, it's just four walls. And at the time I was like, it is these four walls. I, that's exactly what I'm mourning. That's exactly what I'm mourning is these four walls because I understand the expansion and I understand even the benefits of taking things online and all this wonderful stuff. But it was having to be in those four walls every day was the creation of ITS, was the creation of Unmata, was the creation of Amy Sigil. Like that, that was when it all happened, you know, so it was those four walls that I was really attached to. But the beautiful part is that we are expanding and I get to live closer to my parents now. I moved up to Redding, California, which is about two and a half hours north of Sacramento. I would have never been able to do that. And I feel really fortunate to do that now while my parents are in their mid seventies. I'm close to my sister. I haven't lived in the same town as my parents for 35 years. So this is super, this is super special and this is the time to do it. So I'm, I'm faring well going down to Sacramento for two weeks and closing down the studio too was so fucking fun. It was so fun. Like it was hard. I cried every night. I slept on the dance floor. You probably saw photos. I like literally made my bed on the floor. I spent two weeks just loving it up, but it was amazing. And there's nothing like being in Midtown and having sushi and hanging out with your friends and, and making dance. And those four walls are really special, but I'm doing okay. I'm absolutely doing okay. I did an amazing ritual um, with myself and for myself to bring part of Hot Pot up here and put it in the temple. And it was a really cool meeting because Hot Pot was, it was inclusive, but you know, it had a veil 
around it. Like it, it was on K and 16th, right in the heart of downtown, thousands of people walking by, and we were still in this kind of shrouded bubble. And you could like close yourself in, you know, and you could be in there doing whatever you want for hours and watching people walk by and nobody knows what you're doing in there. And so it had this like really private feeling and the temple has no walls and it's in the backyard and I live in a community. I'm not like on 10 acres. So my neighbors can yell at me over the fence. I can hear their lawnmowers. Like it's a completely different. It's beautiful. I'm looking at it right now. So that's why I'm like looking because it's out this window and it's like amazing because it's, it's majestic and it, it looks so sacred, but it has kind of a young, rambunctious, rowdy energy about it because the dog can just run through in the middle of your like deeply personal dance work, you know? Somebody can just like yell over the fence at you. You can hear motors. I mean, it's just, it's, it's like this different energy, but I think it's gonna be good for me. I'm not a very playful person. I'm definitely a joyful person and a friendly person, but I'm not really goofy or silly or playful in that way. So I think that uh, this is gonna be a good lesson for me in a lot of ways. So they are merging and it does feel sacred, but it also feels loud and open. It's such a beautiful space and I love all the sigils that are painted up too. It was so special that you shared those with us. You had all the posts online and every time a new one was done, we got to see it. Oh. That was like my favorite, uh, my favorite project of the summer. I love them so much. But what's interesting is that I actually hosted an outdoor, so it's the outdoor space and it has like open walls. So it's a little bit safe if you're wearing masks. I have a side gate, you can stay six feet apart and I tried to have a dance class up here in Reading and one of the ladies who I thought had a wonderful time, it was a friend of my sister's, messaged my sister afterwards and said, there is no way I can dance in that backyard with that witchcraft on the fence. Oh my. I can't come back. And I was like, the sigils? Like, I mean, yeah, okay, witchcraft, that, that's fine. You, you can peg that on me for sure. It's pretty witchy out there. But I mean, they literally stand for health and wellness, protection, love, wealth. I mean, it was just interesting, but it was kind of like, you know when you try to tone it down, but then your essence just comes out. <laughs> I'm like, oh, if you don't like the sigils, you're not going to like my class eventually once we get deeper. Yes, it's it's a good filter. Yeah, it's a good filter. filter to keep the space safe. You've transitioned to reformat your classes to be available worldwide online, and you've updated your website, you send out newsletters. How has that been going for you? You are just on it. <laughs> it's so different, right? It's such a different way to connect to your student base. Yeah. Um, I have to have a change of perspective about this. I have to. I've tried the other perspective <laughs> and it's not working for me. Um, I've had incredible mentors through this. April Rose has been one of them. Our deep connection of April Rose, who has been very generous with me um, during her trials and errors. And I really dug my heels in. So I am catching a lot of this after the trial and error. So that's, that's a plus. Zoe. Zoe Jakes has been super kind. Sue Hala has been super kind to me, um, but honestly, if not enjoyed it, I don't love the switchover. I didn't do anything for like three, four months, and now it's like eight months in the game. I have lost all of my jobs for two years, this year and next year, they're all canceled. And so if you didn't already have a community base, which I was, I haven't taught a, a weekly class in my community since 2013. So I, I really, lost all the work and it's time to make the switch over but I want to tell you how much I don't I don't like it but I can't I have to stop saying that I have to stop saying that I have to have a different perspective about this so I got some lights and this is so new so this isn't even ready to go so I got the lights I got the headset I got the mixer I got the big monitor. I would like to teach in the temple and I can do live classes in the temple. But when we're filming, I talked about this open air rowdy energy. I can't control the sound when I'm filming outside. So I need to take it inside. This is the setup. It's in its beginning stages, but the monitor, the headset, the mixer, the lights. And I'm using one of those Logitech Brios that everybody's using too. So I have a different camera that's gonna happen. And then I have these fancy lights that are gonna light up and then this is gonna be 
my indoor studio. It's gonna be fun. This was the living room, so I had to take the living room and move it into the dining area. <laughs> so now I have this really amazing little living room and it's attached to the kitchen. So this is kind of fun and it's really cozy and when either one of us cooks, the other one can just be chilling in the living room. What I have seen as far as in the last year, big transitions in your dance realm has been the renaming of ITS and also the reformatting and evolution of ITS. So I know that there's been an ongoing conversations about cultural awareness and appropriation within the dance stylizations and really being respectful to all the regional dances that are included in any fusion dance style. And it's still an ongoing conversation. ITS went from improvisational tribal style to improv team sync. And I was wondering what that means to you and how that led to the evolution of the dance style and the group improv. What an amazing time to be learning. I have to say first that I think I'm getting a lot of credit for taking this first step and being a leader in the name changes, but I'm not. If you know, people have been talking to me since 2011. I have a journal in my notebook from 2013 about the word tribal and me diving deeper about how I feel about this word and I didn't make the changes until January of 2020. So I have to say first that I'm not the leader and I actually dug my heels in like a lot of other people and it took me years to get there. What was the change for me, which is beautiful but also embarrassing at the same time is that I moved from my little bubble of Midtown Sacramento to Redding, California, and I moved a mile away from the Wintu Reservation. And up here I'm with uh, Klamath, Pitt River, Shasta, Wintu, and Winnemum tribes. And in Midtown Sacramento, it was easy for me to think of tribes as ancient, sacred, but ancient like not modern and it wasn't it the land didn't speak to me that way i was like right in the middle of the city there was a museum a california indian museum one of the best museums in california and i saw it as a museum because that's where i was experiencing native american culture was in the museum or going to the miwok grinding rocks also a museum because I was living in this specific place. So I moved to Reading and I got to the first thing I noticed when I drove into the city was supportthetribe.net on billboards everywhere. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting while I'm thinking about this word tribal and it's like supportthetribe.net. So I move here in June and they had a powwow in our area in September. It's only like a couple months later, September or October. And I'm like, yes, I'm gonna go to the powwow. This is gonna be my first powwow. I'm so excited to go. There's a dance board at the powwow and you were encouraged to put up flyers for dance and there's other dance classes up there too besides just the indigenous dance and that's the first time where i was like am i about to put improvisational tribal style on the powwow dance board and that was huge for me and i, I left the powwow thinking okay why do i feel so weird about this because I'm not teaching tribal dances. I'm not teaching tribal dances. I'm not saying that there aren't deep roots to tribes in um, what we all do in our genre specifically, but I am really muddling the meaning. And I started reaching out to the indigenous culture here in my area and I had a meeting, I actually had four, four meetings, but two of them were really the catapult for me. One of them was by Glenn Hayward at the Tribal Health Clinic. And they, everything is tribal here too. You know, some people use First Nations, some people use Indigenous. There's a lot of tribal here. It's the Tribal Health Center. It's the Tribal Casino. It's the tribe, the Wintu tribe, Winnemum tribe. So it's well used here to mean specific things. So I go to talk to Glenn Hayward, who is a 
nurse, I think, or medical director. And he tells me, I love the word tribe. I think it's beautiful. What you do sounds amazing. I don't like improv team sync at all. And we don't have any problem with you using the word tribal. This is an English word. And I walked out with more intuition than I had before because I didn't like it. I didn't like the answer. And this is where it's like, of course, you're not going to ask one person and get the answer for an entire culture. But when I walked out, I was like, no, 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 no. This doesn't align with how I feel. And I was like, I want to get away from this word. And then I ended up talking to Jack Potter, who's the cultural representative for the Wintu people. And he, I guess, said everything that I wanted to hear. <laughs> but he said amazing things that were so beautiful. And one of the things he said was land makes the law and that I have moved onto tribal lands and that spirit is talking to me directly and telling me to change the name. Spirit also said, stay out of everybody else's decisions. We all evolve in different ways. You are not the one to go out and change other people's minds for them lead by example. And then also Jack said, I would never call myself tribal. I am the Wintu. I know what my name is. You're using the word tribal because you all don't know what your name is. And I was like, you're right. We don't know. We don't know what our name is. So we're using the word tribal. And he said, I would never call myself tribal. I know where I came from. He said, you found your name. Your name is Improv Team Sync. You found your name. And then I was like, that's it. And of course, there was some pushback, but now that I've had the exposure to the pushback, um, actually it wasn't pushback. It was, it was really being publicly educated. And I felt in the hot seat for a little while for sure, but you learn the most in the hot seat. So I had a lot of education for a few months and instead of feeling defeated, I felt so empowered that it was really inspiring for me to go and look at the format and look at the names that I have both invented and it's been handed down to me as as well so there was a lot to consider with lineage with how to give respect but have education and, and be humble at the same time and i really was able to look at the whole format and say i'm not using this name anymore we're using this name but it's been empowering and super inspiring and i think one of the concerns for me and my community at first was whitewashing the dance but I think we all have learned now that the dance is whitewashed. I mean, I, I have done that. It is whitewashed. We can accept that. And now we can make things as, as best as we can. And what I think has to happen, of course, is education. And what was like the, the sign for me for this was toxin. You know, we learn the toxin, the low toxin, the mid toxin, and it's a hip figure eight. But this is not what toxin means. You get a little bit deeper and I'm learning that that Taksim is an improvisational, magical section of Egyptian music. So what I'm doing is muddling the name, the word, of a very, very deeply rooted, established, magical thing. So what I need to do is call it a hip figure eight, and then I need to talk about the Taksim and why we called it that. And maybe this is the place where you find your magic figure eight in this music. I mean, it makes sense. It, ma it, it makes sense when you put it all together, but it's just that we had these holes. But we can't call this a toxine, and I can't call what I'm doing tribal dance. I'm muddling the meaning. The name change was the easiest part. And now adding the education and actually finding out how I developed the pivot shift step. I mean, I know I learned it from Jamila, but where did this pivot shift step come from? Can I trace it? Is this just a white American thing to trace it and find out the original name? Like there, there's so much now that I thought I was done with the level one. And now I realize again, I'm never done with the level one. <laughs> I think it's really amazing that so many people that are studying and teaching dance now are really working hard to incorporate a lot of education on the terminology, on the regionality, on everything that has to do with the cultures that are incorporated, especially in fusion dance or Minot inspired dance into their even beginner studies. What a gift for people who are especially just coming into this field of dance in particular. This is really determining whether we get to keep this. Who knows? I don't know, but yeah, we have to do this work. 
and you're doing work even morphing what ITS is. It's my understanding that ITS was a bunch of combinations that were led with cues that you had created for Unmata, is that correct? It started out as an improv format in the restaurant. We danced in a, in a lot of festivals, of course, in restaurants and street performances for Second Saturday. And um, it was there before, which was really cool. So it really feels like I've been researching Unmata's improv for 20 years. Where I'm like, why have we never done it that way? Oh, we never did it that way because it didn't work because of this. Yeah, really interesting how it's developed. I have a great story where Carrie and I were sitting in a stairwell in Florida and we just had the most amazing, magical ITS weekend. And we're sitting in this stairwell and we're both crying and talking about just how much we love dance and how much we love each other and like this community and all those things and Carrie says how did you do this you know how did you make this format and I said Carrie I said I didn't make that format like I've been studying it but I didn't make it and she goes who made it and out of nowhere this thunder comes it was like, not even it was like a Florida thunderstorm out of nowhere and this thunder rattles through the staircase and you can hear like every bolt go down and it was so funny because I come from a very religious background. You probably know my dad is a preacher. So it was just hysterical because it was like, who made this all the way up the channel? But I think it's uh, it's humans. It's humans. You know, I'm dedicated to group work. So that's what I've been studying. I've been studying group work and the medium that I'm using is movement right now. But I'm, I'm studying group dynamics. It's been there since the dawn of humanity. Yeah, it seems like you're incorporating a lot of the concepts behind ITS to allow for a more overall group building dance language for people to use with whatever movement they normally use or things that they are creating themselves so that they have a really great base to create formations and communicate with each other within their own dance community. Yeah, I'm totally in the middle of the research, you know, before me, of course, is ATS. Before that is Jamila Salampour. Before that is Maya, what's her name from where? So I definitely feel like I'm like, yeah, in the middle of the circle of this really amazing human movement research. And on top of all that, you are a part of a new dance conference that's debuting in 2021 called Gathering at the Delta. Can you tell us about that? I can. I think its official name is that it's a Congress. It's the first world Congress of transcultural or transnational dance. And really, Donna Mejia is the spirit behind this Congress. Donna's been wanting to do this for a really long time, and I'm super lucky that she asked me to be part of the design team, also with Brittany Benet, Joanna Ashley, Jax from Earth Dance, and Terry Albred of the Belly Dance Academy. So I'm part of the design team with them. Donna is totally the head behind all of this. And we're actually having a live Instagram coming up where you can probably find it later too. I think it's this Saturday and it'll be on the Gathering at the Delta Instagram. Donna is really going to speak about this in her vision, which is what we're all supporting. So I'm going to paraphrase badly and I'm going to say that there is going to be an opening circle. And I think that Donna is actually planning a grieving session for everything that we have lost, which I thought was really magical. And then we're gonna have a lot of panel discussions. And a lot of these panel discussions are revolving around terminology, cultural appropriation. And we're also gonna have dance workshops with first source teachers, which is really exciting. And I think they're still finalizing that. So I don't know who the first source teachers are and we're having a closing circle as well. The motivation for this is to make this a world Congress and not an American Congress. So we're trying to get this whole thing in 11 different languages and incorporate as many voices as we can in the Congress, which is exciting. Also, one of the super exciting parts about this is that there is a submission for for performances. This is why we're trying to get these flyers translated right away because we really want to get some examples from all over the world. You can submit your performance by January 15th. Donna's put together a panel. They're going to choose submissions about fusion, ethics, and thought-provoking performances, and they're going to archive them at the Gathering of the Delta website. So 
so people can kind of look at the progression of where we are right now and perhaps in the future when we do this again. So if you are interested in sending a performance, you would get a hold of Joanna Ashley and you have to have this done by January 15th. And I know, of course, it's all video. There are some guidelines. Follow the Instagram, please. I'm building the Instagram. Earth Dance is this amazing retreat center somewhere on the East Coast. And they're, of course, on lockdown right now, too. So Jax has some time. Actually, Jax probably doesn't have time. I, I think Jax is very busy. But I don't know how we even got hooked up with this person, but I really love this person. I totally want to rent the space when it's open back up and go to the woods and dance for days. But Jax is hosting the event on earthdance.net. Thanks everybody for, for watching if you made it all the way through to right now. Well, thank you so much, Amy, for visiting and talking about all of the 2020 things. And I am very excited to see all the new online classes and upcoming performances. Thanks for having me. Bye. That's it, guys. I'll be linking all of Amy's information below, as well as the upcoming gathering at the Delta First World Congress of Transnational Transcultural Fusion Dance. How you can get involved, how you can submit applications to perform, and what the Congress is all about. Amy has ongoing ITS and dance classes every week, so check out the links below to jump in on some dance time with Amy. If you like this video, please go ahead and give it a thumbs up. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to my channel so I can continue to make more videos like this for you. Thanks for joining me today, guys.